Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe Chapter Fourteen Evangeline A Young Star which shone o'er life too sweet an image for such glass, a lovely being scarcely formed or moulded, a rose with all its sweetest leaves yet folded. The Mississippi how, as by an enchanted wand, have its scenes been changed since Chateaubriand wrote his prose poetic description of it. Note, in Atala, or The Love and Constancy of Two Savages in the Desert, 1801, by François-Auguste René, Vicomte de Chateaubriand, 1768-1848. As a river of mighty, unbroken solitudes, rolling amid undreamed wonders of vegetable and animal existence. But, as in an hour, this river of dreams and wild romance has emerged to a reality scarcely less visionary and splendid, what other river of the world bears on its bosom to the ocean the wealth and enterprise of such another country, a country whose products embrace all between the tropics and the poles? Those turbid waters, hurrying, foaming, tearing along, an apt resemblance of that headlong tide of business which is poured along its wave by a race more vehement and energetic than any the old world ever saw. Ah! would that they did not also bear along a more fearful freight, the tears of the oppressed, the sighs of the helpless, the bitter prayers of poor ignorant hearts to an unknown God, unknown, unseen, and silent, but who will yet come out of his place and save all the poor of the earth? The slanting light of the setting sun quivers on the sea-like expanse of the river. The shivery canes and the tall dark cypress, hung with wreaths of dark funereal moss, glow in the golden ray as the heavily laden steamboat marches onward. Piled with cotton bales from many a plantation, up over deck and sides, till she seems in the distance a square massive block of grey, she moves heavily onward to the nearing mart. We must look some time among its crowded decks before we shall find again our humble friend Tom. High on the upper deck, in a little nook among the everywhere predominant cotton bales, at last we may find him. Partly from confidence inspired by Mr. Shelby's representations, and partly from the remarkably inoffensive and quiet character of the man, Tom had insensibly won his way far into the confidence even of such a man as Haley. At first he had watched him narrowly through the day, and never allowed him to sleep at night unfettered, but the uncomplaining patience and apparent contentment of Tom's manner led him gradually to discontinue these restraints, and for some time Tom had enjoyed a sort of parole of honor, being permitted to come and go freely where he pleased on the boat. Ever quiet and obliging, and more than ready to lend a hand in every emergency which occurred among the workmen below, he had won the good opinion of all the hands, and spent many hours in helping them with as hearty a good will as ever he worked on a Kentucky farm. When there seemed to be nothing for him to do, he would climb to a nook among the cotton bales of the upper deck, and busy himself in studying over his Bible, and it is there we see him now. For a hundred or more miles above New Orleans, the river is higher than the surrounding country, and rolls its tremendous volume between massive levees twenty feet in height. The traveller from the deck of the steamer, as from some floating castle-top, overlooks the whole country for miles and miles around. Tom, therefore, had spread out full before him, in plantation after plantation, a map of the life to which he was approaching. He saw the distant slaves at their toil. He saw afar their villages of huts gleaming out in long rows on many a plantation distant from the stately mansions and pleasure-grounds of the master. And as the moving picture passed on, his poor, foolish heart would be turning backward to the Kentucky farm, with its old shadowy beaches, to the master's house, with its wide, cool halls, and, nearby, the little cabin overgrown with the multiflora and bignonia. There he seemed to see familiar faces of comrades who had grown up with him from infancy, he saw his busy wife bustling in her preparations for his evening meals. He heard the merry laugh of his boys at their play, and the chirrup of the baby at his knee. And then, with a start, 
all faded, and he saw again the cane brakes and cypresses and gliding plantations, and heard again the creaking and groaning of the machinery, all telling him too plainly that all that phase of life had gone by forever. In such a case, you write to your wife and send messages to your children. But Tom could not write. The mail for him had no existence and the gulf of separation was unbridged by even a friendly word or signal. Is it strange, then, that some tears fall on the pages of his Bible, as he lays it on the cotton bale, and, with patient finger, threading his slow way from word to word, traces out its promises? Having learned late in life, Tom was but a slow reader, and passed on laboriously from verse to verse. Fortunate for him was it that the book he was intent on was one which slow reading cannot injure, nay, one whose words, like ingots of gold, seem often to need to be weighed separately, that the mind may take in their priceless value. Let us follow him a moment, as, pointing to each word and pronouncing each half aloud, he reads, Let not your heart be troubled. In my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you." Cicero, when he buried his darling and only daughter, had a heart as full of honest grief as poor Tom's, perhaps no fuller, for both were only men. But Cicero could pause over no such sublime words of hope, and look to no such future reunion and if he had seen them, ten to one he would not have believed. He must fill his head first with a thousand questions of authenticity of manuscript and correctness of translation. But to poor Tom, there it lay, just what he needed, so evidently true and divine that the possibility of a question never entered his simple head. It must be true, for, if not true, how could he live? As for Tom's Bible, Though it had no annotations and helps in margin from learned commentators, still it had been embellished with certain waymarks and guide-boards of Tom's own invention, and which helped him more than the most learned expositions could have done. It had been his custom to get the Bible read to him by his master's children, in particular by young Master George, and as they read he would designate, by bold strong marks and dashes, with pen and ink, the passages which more particularly gratified his ear or affected his heart. His Bible was thus marked through, from one end to the other, with a variety of styles and designations, so he could in a moment seize upon his favorite passages, without the labor of spelling out what lay between them. And while it lay there before him, every passage breathing of some old home scene, and recalling some past enjoyment, his Bible seemed to him all of this life that remained as well as the promise of a future one. Among the passengers on the boat was a young gentleman of fortune and family, resident in New Orleans, who bore the name of St. Clair. He had with him a daughter, between five and six years of age, together with a lady who seemed to claim relationship to both, and to have the little one especially under her charge. Tom had often caught glimpses of this little girl, for she was one of those busy, tripping creatures that can be no more contained in one place than a sunbeam or a summer breeze. Nor was she one that, once seen, could be easily forgotten. Her form was the perfection of childish beauty, without its usual chubbiness and squareness of outline. There was about it an undulating and aerial grace, such as one might dream of for some mythic and allegorical being. Her face was remarkable less for its perfect beauty of feature than for a singular and dreamy earnestness of expression, which made the ideal start when they looked at her, and by which the dullest and most literal were impressed, without exactly knowing why. The shape of her head, and the turn of her neck and bust, was peculiarly noble, and the long golden-brown hair that floated like a cloud around it, the deep spiritual gravity of her violet-blue eyes, shaded by heavy fringes of golden-brown, all marked her out from other children and made every one turn and look after her, as she glided hither and thither on the boat. Nevertheless the little one was not what you would have called either a grave child or a sad one. On the contrary, an airy and innocent playfulness seemed to flicker like the shadow of summer leaves over her childish face, and around her buoyant figure. 
She was always in motion, always with a half-smile on her rosy mouth, flying hither and thither, with an undulating and cloud-like tread, singing to herself as she moved, as in a happy dream. Her father and female guardian were incessantly busy in the pursuit of her, but, when caught, she melted from them again like a summer cloud, and as no word of chiding or reproof ever fell on her ear for whatever she chose to do, she pursued her own way all over the boat. Always dressed in white, she seemed to move like a shadow through all sorts of places, without contracting spot or stain, and there was not a corner or nook above or below where those fairy footsteps had not glided, and that visionary golden head with its deep blue eyes fleeted along. The fireman, as he looked up from his sweaty toil, sometimes found those eyes looking wonderingly into the raging depths of the furnace, and fearfully and pityingly at him, as if she thought him in some dreadful danger. Anon the steersman at the wheel paused and smiled, as the picture-like head gleamed through the window of the roundhouse, and in a moment was gone again. A thousand times a day rough voices blessed her, and smiles of unwanted softness stole over hard faces as she passed, and when she tripped fearlessly over dangerous places, rough, sooty hands were stretched involuntarily out to save her and smooth her path. Tom, who had the soft, impressible nature of his kindly race, ever yearning toward the simple and childlike, watched the little creature with daily increasing interest. To him she seemed something almost divine, and whenever her golden head and deep blue eyes peered out upon him from behind some dusky cotton bale, or looked down upon him over some ridge of packages, he half believed that he saw one of the angels stepped out of his New Testament. Often and often she walked mournfully round the place where Haley's gang of men and women sat in their chains. She would glide in among them and look at them with an air of perplexed and sorrowful earnestness and sometimes she would lift their chains with her slender hands, and then sigh woefully as she glided away. Several times she appeared suddenly among them, with her hands full of candy, nuts, and oranges, which she would distribute joyfully to them, and then be gone again. Tom watched the little lady a great deal, before he ventured on any overtures towards acquaintanceship. He knew an abundance of simple acts to propitiate and invite the approaches of the little people, and he resolved to play his part right skillfully. He could cut cunning little baskets out of cherry stones, could make grotesque faces on hickory nuts, or odd jumping figures out of elder pith, and he was a very pan in the manufacture of whistles of all sizes and sorts. His pockets were full of miscellaneous articles of attraction, which he had hoarded in days of old for his master's children and which he now produced with commendable prudence and economy, one by one, as overtures for acquaintance and friendship. The little one was shy, for all her busy interest in everything going on, and it was not easy to tame her. For a while she would perch like a canary-bird on some box or package near Tom, while busy in the little arts aforenamed, and take from him, with a kind of grave bashfulness, the little articles he offered but at last they got on quite confidential terms. "'What's little Missy's name?' said Tom, at last, when he thought matters were ripe to push such an inquiry. "'Evangeline St. Clair,' said the little one, "'though Papa and everybody else call me Eva. Now what's your name?' "'My name's Tom. The little children used to call me Uncle Tom, way back thar in Kentuck.' "'Then I mean to call you Uncle Tom, because, you see, I like you,' said Eva. So, Uncle Tom, where are you going? I don't know, Miss Eva. Don't know, said Eva. No, I am going to be sold to somebody I don't know who. My papa can buy you, said Eva quickly. And if he buys you, you will have good times. I mean to ask him this very day. Thank you, my little lady, said Tom. The boat here stopped at a small landing to take in wood and Eva, hearing her father's voice, bounded nimbly away. Tom rose up and went forward to offer his service in wooding, and soon was busy among the hands. Eva and her father were standing together by the railings to see the boat start from the landing-place. The wheel had made two or three revolutions in the water when, by some sudden movement, the little one suddenly lost her balance and fell sheer over the side of the boat into the water. Her father, scarce knowing what he did, was plunging in after her, but was held back by some behind him, 
who saw that more efficient aid had followed his child. Tom was standing just under her on the lower deck as she fell. He saw her strike the water and sink, and was after her in a moment. A broad-chested, strong-armed fellow, it was nothing for him to keep afloat in the water till, in a moment or two, the child rose to the surface, and he caught her in his arms, and, swimming with her to the boat's side, handed her up, all dripping, to the grasp of hundreds of hands, which, as if they had all belonged to one man, were stretched eagerly out to receive her. A few moments more, and her father bore her, dripping and senseless, to the lady's cabin, where, as is usual in cases of the kind, there ensued a very well-meaning and kind-hearted strife among the female occupants generally, as to who should do the most things to make a disturbance, and to hinder her recovery in every way possible. It was a sultry, close day, the next day, as the steamer drew near to New Orleans. A general bustle of expectation and preparation was spread through the boat. In the cabin one and another were gathering their things together and arranging them, preparatory to going ashore. The steward and chambermaid and all were busily engaged in cleaning, furbishing, and arranging the splendid boat, preparatory to a grand entree. On the lower deck sat our friend Tom, with his arms folded, and anxiously, from time to time, turning his eyes towards a group on the other side of the boat. There stood the fair Evangeline, a little paler than the day before, but otherwise exhibiting no traces of the accident which had befallen her. A graceful, elegantly formed young man stood by her, carelessly leaning one elbow on a bale of cotton, while a large pocket-book lay open before him. It was quite evident, at a glance, that the gentleman was Eva's father. There was the same noble cast of head, the same large blue eyes, the same golden-brown hair, yet the expression was wholly different. In the large, clear blue eyes, though in form and color exactly similar, there was wanting that misty, dreamy depth of expression. All was clear, bold, and bright, but with the light wholly of this world. The beautifully cut mouth had a proud and somewhat sarcastic expression, while an air of free and easy superiority sat not ungracefully in every turn and movement of his fine form. He was listening, with a good-humoured negligent air, half comic, half contemptuous, to Haley, who was very volubly expatiating on the quality of the article for which they were bargaining. "'All the moral and Christian virtues bound in black morocco complete,' he said, when Haley had finished. "'Well, now, my good fellow, what's the damage, as they say in Kentucky? In short, what's to be paid out for this business? How much are you going to cheat me now? Hmm, out with it!' "'Well,' said Haley, "'If I should save thirteen hundred dollars for that, our fellow, I shouldn't but just save myself. I shouldn't now, really.' "'Poor fellow,' said the young man, fixing his keen, mocking blue eye on him. "'But I suppose you'd let me have him for that, out of a particular regard for me.' "'Well, the young lady here seems to be sought on him, and naturally enough.' "'Oh, certainly there's a call on your benevolence, my friend. Now, as a matter of Christian charity, how cheap could you afford to let him go to oblige a young lady that's particularly sought on him?' "'Well, now, just think on it,' said the trader. "'Just look on them limbs, broad-chested, strong as a horse. Look at his head. Them high foreheads allays shows calculating niggers. They'll do any kind of thing.' I've marked that ar. Now, a nigger of that ar heft and build is worth considerable, just as you may say, for his body, supposing he's stupid, but come to put in his calculatin' faculties, and them which I can show he has on common, why, of course, it makes him come higher. Why, that our fellow managed his master's whole farm. He has a extraordinary talent for business." "'Bad, bad, very bad, knows altogether too much,' said the young man, with the same mocking smile playing about his mouth. "'Never will do in the world. Your smart fellows are always running off, stealing horses, and raising the devil generally. I think he'll have to take off a couple of hundred for his smartness.' "'Well, there might be something in that are, if it weren't for his character. But I can show recommends from his master and others to prove he is one of your real pious, the most humble praying pious critter you ever did see. Why, he's been called a preacher in them parts he came from. And I must use him for a family chaplain, possibly, added the young man dryly. That's quite an idea. Religion is a remarkably scarce article at our house. You're joking now. How do you know I am? Didn't you just warrant him for a preacher? Has he been examined by any synod or council? Come, hand over your papers. 
If the trader had not been sure, by a certain good-humored twinkle in the large eye, that all this banter was sure, in the long run, to turn out a cash concern, he might have been somewhat out of patience. As it was, he laid down a greasy pocket-book on the cotton bales, and began anxiously studying over certain papers in it, the young man standing by, the while, looking down on him with an air of careless, easy drollery. "'Papa, do buy him. It's no matter what you pay,' whispered Eva softly, getting up on a package, and putting her arm around her father's neck. "'You have money enough, I know. I want him.' "'What for, pussy?' Are you going to use him for a rattle-box, or a rocking-horse, or what? I want to make him happy." An original reason, certainly. Here the trader handed up a certificate signed by Mr. Shelby, which the young man took with the tips of his long fingers and glanced over carelessly. "'A gentlemanly hand,' he said, "'and well spelt, too. Well, now, I'm not sure, after all, about this religion,' said he, the old wicked expression returning to his eye. The country is almost ruined with pious white people, and such pious politicians as we have just before elections, such pious goings-on in all departments of church and state, that a fellow does not know who'll cheat him next. I don't know either about religions being up in the market just now. I have not looked in the papers lately to see how it sells. How many hundred dollars now do you put on for this religion? You like to be joking now, said the trader, but then there's sense under all that are. I know there's differences in religion. Some kinds is miserable. There's your meetin' pious. There's your singin' roarin' pious. Them are ain't no account in black or white. But these raily is. And I've seen it in niggers as often as any, your rail softly, quiet, steady, honest pious. But the hull world couldn't tempt em to do nothin' that they think's wrong. And you see in this letter what Tom's old master says about him. Now, said the young man, stooping gravely over his book of bills, if you can assure me that I really can buy this kind of pious, and that it will be set down to my account in the book up above, as something belonging to me, I wouldn't care if I did go a little extra for it. How'd you say? Well, Raleigh, really, I can't do that, said the trader. I'm a-thinking that every man'll have to hang on his own hook in them our quarters. Rather hard on a fellow that pays extra on religion, and can't trade with it in the state where he wants it most, ain't it now?" said the young man, who had been making out a roll of bills while he was speaking. "'There, count your money, old boy,' he added, as he handed the roll to the trader. "'All right,' said Haley, his face beaming with delight, and pulling out an old inkhorn, he proceeded to fill out a bill of sale, which in a few moments he handed to the young man. I wonder now, if I was divided up and inventoried, said the latter, as he ran over the paper, how much I might bring. Say, so much for the shape of my head, so much for a high forehead, so much for arms and hands and legs, and then so much for education, learning, talent, honesty, religion. Bless me, there would be small charge on that last, I'm thinking. But come, Eva, he said, and taking the hand of his daughter, he stepped across the boat, and carelessly putting the tip of his finger under Tom's chin, said, good-humouredly, Look up, Tom, and see how you like your new master. Tom looked up. It was not in nature to look into that gay, young, handsome face without a feeling of pleasure, and Tom felt the tears start in his eyes as he said heartily, God bless you, massa. Well, I hope he will. What's your name? Tom? quite as likely to do for your asking as mine, from all accounts. Can you drive horses, Tom?" "'I've been always used to horses,' said Tom. "'Master Shelby raised heaps of em. Well, I think I shall put you in a coachie, on condition that you won't be drunk more than once a week, unless in cases of emergency, Tom.' Tom looked surprised and rather hurt, and said, "'I never drink, Master.' "'I've heard that story before, Tom. But then we'll see. It will be a special accommodation to all concerned if you don't. Never mind, my boy," he added good-humouredly, seeing Tom still looked grave. I don't doubt you mean to do well. I certain do, massa," said Tom. And you shall have good times," said Eva. Papa is very good to everybody, only he always will laugh at them. Papa is much obliged to you for his recommendation," said St. Clair, laughing, as he turned on his heel and walked away. End of chapter 14